I guess first I should say I don't want to give the impression that I did all this work on my own. Like every state and federal agency and every academic institution anywhere near Lake Erie helped with this. And I don't know if Don Einhouse is in the audience, but there he is. Okay, so he was instrumental in getting all this work off the ground and continues to be a valuable, valuable source of information. So the things to understand about Lake Erie Walleye before I start. We're lucky enough to have a completely self-sustaining population in Lake Erie that's supported by over 20 spawning sites. So what I mean by spawning sites is a shoal or stream uh, that fish return to every year and they show fidelity to. Uh, that population supports fairly large commercial and recreational fisheries. Last year, the harvest was about 5 million walleye. So we have a pretty sophisticated management structure in place to deal with that. Um, but there are still some uncertainties, chiefly surrounding how walleye move around the lake and how that overlaps with where and when harvest occurs. And so that's what we're trying to address here. Jim already talked about this, but there's three basins, the west, central, and east. That's all you need to know. <laughs> In a nutshell, this is how we manage Lake Erie walleye right now. Everything to the west of that dotted line of what's called the quota management area. So what that means is annual stock assessment, quota setting procedures, allocation of harvest to different jurisdic jurisdictions and fisheries. Everything to the east of that line in the purple zone is outside the quota management area. So they don't get a stock assessment. They're not included in the lake-wide management structure. We want to get the entire lake included in, in the management structure. So the reason why they're not both included, is chiefly because of uncertainty surrounding how walleye move <coughs> in between these two areas. So that's what we're trying to address here. Okay, I talked about spawning shoals before. This is the picture of how spawning is vastly oversimplified in Lake Erie. So there's a bunch of, uh, oh, what did I do? It's the middle. <coughs> there's a bunch of um, spawning areas in the west Highly productive, large, they produce around 40 million adults currently. In the east, we also have a bunch of uh, spawning areas. They're smaller. We're pretty sure this is less than 1 million adults that these are producing. So that's the oversimplified picture of spawning. Okay. What we're trying to answer here is, are there behavioral differences between these spawning stocks? Do all the spawning stocks represent a shared resource? across the whole lake? Are they vulnerable to all the different fisheries in the lake? How can we use this information to inform management? And then if I have time, not that it has any management implications, but just because it's fun, we'll look at um, some individual fish behaviors that are cool, if I have a couple minutes. Jim already talked about this. We have walleye tagged. Um, the tag goes off every two minutes. The receiver picks up the tag. And at the end of the year, we pop the receiver and pick it up. That's, a, that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> okay, these are all the receivers. Lake Erie's wired. If a fish moves, we pretty much know about it. Okay, so let's first talk about migration or movement of fish that spawn in that western area and, and where they move throughout the year. All right, um, so blue dots are fish. The red circles are spawning areas. They appear to be a little offset at the moment. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> what, what we're doing is going from April to April. So they get done spawning, and you're going to see where they move until they spawn <coughs> next time. And I'll try to narrate it a little bit. All right, go ahead. So they get done with spawning, and they make this spectacular movement into the lake, all the way to Buffalo, fairly rapidly. So now we're into summer, August, September. October. So these fish are vulnerable to every fishery in the lake, both commercial and recreational. Now we're getting into winter and they start heading back home to spawn. So I think it's fairly evident here that these represent a shared resource for every jurisdiction in the lake. They're vulnerable to every fishery in the lake. Right now they're not being managed that way. They're being managed as if they're only vulnerable from this point west. We'd like to change that and we're hopeful that this is gonna help us do that. Okay, now 
let's look at the fish that spawn in the east basin of the lake and what they do over the course of a calendar year from April to April. Okay, same setup. We're going from April at spawning to March. Uh, these are two spawning areas. They're in Lake Shoals in uh, the east basin. Okay, go ahead. This is May, June, July, August. Now we're in like the peak of the fishing season. Now we're in the fall, and they're really starting to head back to their spawning shoals. So while some of these fish did move in to the central basin and the western basin. It's really a very small fraction of them that did so. Most of them really don't leave the eastern basin. So in a sense, these fish are shared between Pennsylvania, New York, and the province of Ontario, but they're not a lake-wide resource. And there's an issue of scale here. This is only <coughs> a million fish versus 40 million for the, the western basin uh, fish. But they did spread out across the whole basin. So now let's look at a real oddball. This is a river spawning population. We've been tagging this population for decades, really, and we rarely get tag returns back. So I'm talking about jaw tags. Uh, and it was kind of baffling as to why that was for a long time. Um, so again, April to April. Go ahead, Jim. A couple of fish move around. For the most part, these things hang tight to the North Shore and this is why we never get tag returns from this population because they don't go anywhere. They're not vulnerable to any fishermen. Which was kind of baffling to me how, how all the populations in the lake could behave in a similar manner except for this one who does this totally, <coughs> totally opposite thing. Anybody else has ideas as to why that is? I'm, I'm open to it. <laughs> They're Canadian. They're Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> So glossing over a tremendous amount of quantitative details, occupancy modeling, and, and things like that, I want to try to describe how we're thinking this is going to be useful to management. This is a representation of our fishery effort in Lake Erie. Blue is commercial, red is recreational. So the Canadians are commercial fishing and the Americans are sport fishing. This is how it kind of breaks out. So. We have those 40 million walleye. What this work has shown us is that roughly 10% of them make it to the East Basin. They're not all there at any given one time, but roughly 10% over the course of a year will make it there and be vulnerable to our fisheries in the East. So based on that, we can start to think about how we do quota management and stock assessment, how we allocate harvest among all the jurisdictions. It's something that we're not doing now, but I'm fairly positive this is going to get us there. So I think I have a few minutes, right? Okay. So, like I said, this doesn't have any major major implications, but it's just cool, so I thought I'd show it. These are behaviors of some individuals. Okay, so this is a male, and it uh, spawns every year on Two Saint Reef in the Western Basin. It's pretty big, 25 inches. So let's look at what it does, uh, looks like from 2014 to 2016. So it's in the eastern basin. It moved like 200 miles in 20 days. And then it goes back to spawn. Let's see if it does it again. Yep, it does the exact same thing uh, the next year. And I'm only showing two years here, but this is, this is very repeatable for this fish. So it's, and it spends most of its time in the east here where it's vulnerable to uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Ontario fisheries. So I thought that was pretty interesting. The conventional wisdom in Lake Erie is that the females are the ones that move, make the big movements, big females. So here's a big female. It's 28 inches. Again, it spawns here on Two Saint Reef. We have five years of data here, so it's going to happen pretty quick. It goes from 13, 2013 to 2017. Um, so let's watch, watch what she does. Back to spawn. Back to spawn. 
<laughs> She's back to spawn. We have another receiver, but she doesn't go too far. She goes back to spawn. Same thing every year. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Now this one was one that kind of made me, made me break out into a cold sweat because we have genetic studies going on um, that rely on spawning site fidelity. <laughs> okay, so, so this, this fish is a female, 23 inches, was captured at spawning time in the Grand River. Um, and she appeared to visit multiple spawning sites all over the lake. So let's watch, watch what she does here. It takes a year um, to get going here, but it'll happen. So we're approaching spawning time now, and she goes to Two Saint Reef and definitely appears to exhibit spawning behavior on the reef. And she goes to Buffalo, to that reef, and then she goes back into the Grand River. Okay, now, now we're approaching spawning time in the next year. She goes to Two Saint Reef, appears to spawn, appears to go to the Buffalo spawning site, and then back to the Grand River again. That's all happening within the you know, time and temperature frame of spawning. So that made me a little worried about our genetic studies that are going on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what did we learn here? Different populations definitely exhibit different degrees of movement, which is kind of surprising that, that you know, certain spawning rivers or shoals would do something totally different than the other ones. Um, the West Basin walleye definitely are a shared resource. They are vulnerable to all the fisheries in the lake, and they occupy the entire lake. Uh, the East Basin walleye are a shared resource, but not in the same way, only, only within the eastern portion of the lake. Um, and some stocks, like the Grand River stock, aren't shared at all, and they really have no impact on fisheries. Um, there's strong evidence for repeat behaviors, both at the stock level and at the individual fish level, which is interesting. So how can we apply this uh, to our management in Lake Erie. I think, I'm fairly certain, this is gonna allow us to incorporate that East Basin into the lake-wide management framework, which is something that we're uh, really keen to do. Um, it also helps us interpret our fishery dependent and independent fisheries of abundance. If we set a gill net in the East Basin in September, what does that mean? What fish are we catching? It seems like we're, we have a mix, so we're not able to identify cohorts for our um, catch and age models. It's definitely gonna impact how we allocate quota around the lake to the different jurisdictions. And it underscores something that we already knew is that decisions that we make in the West Basin about habitat and fishing on spawning shoals, things like this, definitely have an impact lake-wide, including all the way to the east. And it underscores the need for continue to continued cooperation and communication uh, between agencies, which is something we already do pretty well in Lake Erie as evidenced by this enormous project that everybody worked on together. Thank you so much. <laughs>